Over the last few years, we've seen a rise in attempts to land on the moon by a number of different companies and space agencies with mixed results. So today, we're asking the question, why is it so difficult to land on the moon? Please make sure you're following us on social media. You can find us at Space and Things Podcast on Threads, Instagram, and Facebook. And please consider joining us on patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, it's time for episode 191 of the Space and Things podcast. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carton. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 191 of our podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, I'm about to go traveling this week. Uh, oh, of course, I'll tell yes. You guys, yeah, I'm going uh, to an event in actually Greenville, South Carolina, so I'm really excited. I'll, I'll talk more about it when I get back next week, Okay, uh, and I'll probably have some pictures and stuff as, as well. But uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited. So how you doing, Dave? I'm good. Do you know what I'm really excited about? This episode. Me too. Me too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to crack on with it. This really is something that we have talked about for months and been trying yes. to figure out who the right person to ask. And uh, we've, we've sent a few emails around. We had various people suggested to us to talk to about this topic. So... Obviously, it's difficult to land a spacecraft on the moon, and we've seen that over the last few years. We've had a number of companies and countries try and land with limited success. In February 2019, an Israeli lander crashed onto the surface. In July 2019, the Indian space program had a lander with a similar fate. November 22, the Japanese space agency lost communication with their lander, and the, the probe missed the moon altogether. A different Japanese lander crashed into the moon in December 22. The Russians crashed into the moon in August of 2023. And we've seen two private missions from the US this year. Uh, the Peregrine lander had a leaky thruster, so never even got to attempt the landing, but the Intuitive Machines Nova C mission did land on the moon, but one of its legs broke upon landing, so it fell over. While during this period there have been some success stories as well, the trend has seemed to have been more towards failure. So we started, humans that is, started attempt to land on the moon back in 1962. There was some impact missions before that, but the first soft landing attempt was 1962. And while, while the first soft landing didn't take place until 1966 by the Soviet Union's Luna 9 spacecraft, I think most people consider that we've cracked landing on the moon. You know, we had six landings of the Apollo program that were all a success, and most people think we know how to do it and we can do it fairly easy. But the reality, as we always say is that space is hard. And so today we're talking to Brandon Dotson, a PhD student at the University of Central Florida and a U.S. Army helicopter test pilot who is working on the topic of the challenge of lunar landings for his thesis. Brandon graduated in 2010 from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point with a double major in physics and chemistry with honors. He earned a master's in physics at Caltech. And while he was studying there, he served as a research assistant in NASA's JPL in advanced propulsion development, and at the Space Radiation Lab and Solar Wind Physics. He later earned, wow, a second master's <laughs> in aerospace engineering, as one does, from Georgia Tech with a focus on aircraft design and rocket propulsion. He served as a helicopter pilot in Afghanistan, is an Eagle Scout, a certified scuba instructor, a licensed parachutist, and holds a Wilderness First Responder Medical certi Certification and Emergency First Response Medical Certification. Oh, my God. I have done nothing in my <laughs> yeah, life. Right? Um, oh, my God. I've done nothing. This isn't even his full CV. And today, he's talking to us. Houston, Space and Things Base here. Dave and Emily have landed. Welcome, Brandon. Thanks for joining us today. So first, tell us your background. You're an Army helicopter test pilot. How did you get interested in aviation and aerospace? Yeah, no, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I've been kind of a space nerd uh, since I was a young, young boy. I remember my parents got a, uh, a new refrigerator when I was like, I, I was probably like five. 
Uh, and that became my uh, spaceship in the basement, uh, yes. dreaming of going off to the stars. And uh, <laughs> it sort of became the natural progression when I went off to college, right? Of uh, I, I knew I was into science and engineering and math and continued that love for space and, and things that fly. Um, and so that uh, that's what led me to becoming a, eventually a pilot and then a test pilot farther down on the road and, and still keeping one foot in, in the space industry as well. All right. So kind of getting to our main topic, uh, we've long discussed on this show lunar landings. Despite being done during the 60s and 70s, these are challenging and we've seen how many companies have had issues landing vehicles on the moon. Can you give us some background on early lunar missions and the difficulties encountered during those missions? Uh, for example, I know the Ranger program had a ton of issues before it actually had a su successful mission. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, the first few missions to the moon back in the very early days, I think we we have been uh, realized it was going to be so hard to land that we we actually did some impactor uh, spacecraft as well, uh, and that was intentional. We started with robotic spacecraft and kind of got our, our legs, if you will, uh, with that. <laughs> and there was just so many unknowns about the moon and the lunar surface of what to expect. Scientists back then thought, you know, maybe you would land on this material. It would be so soft that you just keep sinking and sinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we had to use those robotic spacecraft to really kind of flush that out. Uh, and some of those early ones were challenging as well. Uh, even some of the robotic ones, uh, I believe it was a surveyor one that that landed and basically skipped a few times, uh, <laughs> bounced like 30 feet or so in the air, and then continued to to come to a stop on the surface. Uh, and certainly anytime you put humans on it, that, that sort of ups the ante, if you will, right? So as we transitioned into Apollo and we finally started to to land on the surface there, there were some unique challenges, I think, that uh, that we saw, particularly landing in that dusty environment and some of the later Apollo missions landing in uh, more complex terrain. It's a really difficult area to land. Just the nature of the moon and what you're up against and, and the dust and the, the whole lot, it, it's just very challenging. Yeah, absolutely. So sort of building on that question, what specific conditions make a lunar landing more or less challenging than landing a spacecraft on Earth or even on Mars? So really the lack of atmosphere on the moon uh, is one of the big challenges, not just for, you know, the aerodynamics of trying to land on a surface where you might be able to leverage like a parachute or something yeah. um, or that, that drag to help slow you down. Um, but also in the sense that the surface itself, because of not having an atmosphere, is just constantly bombarded for roughly four and a half billion years of every little like of dust or micrometeorite impacts or uh, um, energetic particles hitting the surface. And so the moon itself and the surface conditions on the moon are really unlike anything we've seen on Earth. It's definitely different than what we see on Mars and, and other planetary bodies just because of that lack of atmosphere. On top of that, you also only have one-sixth the gravity, right? And that, that plays an important part. So when you do land and you loft particles... Uh, you don't have the atmosphere to slow them down. You don't have the gravity to pull it back down. Uh, and so there have been some recent papers where uh, if you land a, a large 100 ton or so uh, mass on the surface, that the exhaust velocities are high enough to actually kick some of that dust up into lunar orbit. Um, and wow. it will just hang out there basically for all of your other spacecraft to fly <laughs> through. So it's certainly something that we, we need to solve and we need to think about. And, and I do think... Some of the best minds in the country are, are working on this problem to, to try to solve it. Absolutely. This is kind of uh, related, but are there any other solar system bodies that you're aware of that have similarities to the moon? Uh, not that we're going there anytime soon, probably, but are there any places that, you know, are kind of similar, maybe like Mercury, I, I, like that might pose, you know, similar challenges to future spacecraft? So I think each planetary surface is kind of its own unique challenge. We've been very fortunate with the space program being able to go out to different bodies and, and kind of see, you know, visiting all the different planets and um, uh, planetesimals. And uh, really all the conditions are kind of unique, right? The moon is is very unlike what we see on Mars, which is very unlike what we see on, you know, Titan or uh, maybe an asteroid. And a lot of that comes down to uh, how those surfaces are formed slowly over time and what environments they're exposed to. 
you know, the gravity is a, is a big piece there as well. Um, we see certain formations like asteroids, you know, for a while NASA was on a, uh, a mission to go out, to send humans to an asteroid. And so a lot of the work went into studying well, what happens in microgravity. Um, and we end up with, you know, rubble pile asteroids. Uh, and I guess to say like the regolith, which is basically the, you know, crushed rock that forms the surface, uh, is not necessarily the same on every planetary body yeah, when we when we start to look around. Absolutely, and that that brings me to my next question. Uh, another issue with the Earth's moon is obviously the regolith. I, I think we only begin to understood during Apollo what you know the, what the dust on the moon could do to uh, spacesuits and possibly to human beings. Some of the Apollo astronauts had health issues that I don't know if they know for sure, but are suspected that are caught could have been caused by lunar regolith exposure. So what kind of challenges does the actual dust on the moon uh, pose to space vehicles? Like I said, we know what it can do to people. Yeah, well, dust is certainly a big issue. Um, I mean, it, it is all encompassing right on the surface. And and you're right, we saw it during Apollo. Um, there were a number of cases where astronauts were reporting, I guess, uh, lunar hay fever, I think is what they referred to it as, <laughs> small grain particles that would essentially upset your respiratory system, if you will. Spacecraft wise, it was also a challenge, um, gets into vents and seals and rubs on surfaces and on uh, fabrics, right, uh, on the spacesuits. And it also gets kicked up when uh, you land, and that's uh, obviously not good. There was kind of a unique uh, case during Apollo 12, where they landed next to the Surveyor 3 robotics spacecraft, basically that Robot landed there, and then um, a couple hundred meters away, uh, astronauts landed a few years later, and they went out and actually like took pieces of that robotic spacecraft and brought them back to uh, Earth. I think they're sitting in the Smithsonian now, which is pretty cool. But even landing that far away with a smaller, you know, lunar excursion module, they've basically sandblasted uh, that, that equipment, and you can you can see it under a microscope and stuff, all the pitting and cracking. Um, just from that landing. And so when we take that and kind of think about, okay, well, now we're landing with much larger vehicles. Uh, what is what is that going to do? And if we're landing at the same place now over and over yeah. again, and if we're trying to build a base, that, that certainly tells us there's something there that's, yeah. that's important. Wow. Yeah, I didn't even think about that because, yeah, you could have uh, potentially... Uh... I like your mug. He's had, he has a moon mug every day. Oh, of course. Yes, thank you. <laughs> On brand. He's a moon mug. But um, no, that that's... Amazing. I never thought about that because <laughs> if you settle the moon or if you put long-term infrastructure on the moon, it's going to keep getting bombarded by that dust. That is incredible. I didn't even think about it. Wow. Wow. Okay. This is exploding my mind a bit. <laughs> so next question. Do you think um, the human factor in lunar landings makes much of a difference? As we know, Apollo had crews on it. Would there be more or less of a success rate with crewed vehicles, you think? Does that really even matter or what, what's your thoughts? So certainly as somebody who's working on their uh, degree in planetary science here, I'm a huge fan of robotic spacecraft, but uh, there is something to be said about putting humans on a vehicle and going somewhere, right? It, I think if you just go to Google and you type in space exploration, right, the, the first uh, probably like 95% of the images will pop up and it'll have a human in it, right? There's, there's a reason that we're, we're drawn to that. But more importantly, I think the human aspect, it, it does come down to uh, that reaction time and being able to, to solve complex problems in, in the moment, if you will, right? And to be able to react to what's being thrown at them. So I, I do think there is certainly value of having, uh, you know, astronauts on board and being able to interject. I mean, the, the most famous case, of course, is, is the Apollo 11 landing as, as Neil Armstrong had to, to come on manual control and avoid the train and boulders and, and be able to set it down with just barely enough fuel remaining. And so I don't know that that would have happened if, if it was fully autonomous, right? So I think there's a big push. We see it with uh, crewed missions to like the ISS where autonomy is definitely a helpful thing. Um, but when you're landing in sort of a dusty, dark, complex terrain, being able to come into the loop as a human and react and and make adjustments, I think is going to be crucial. You know, we'd really hate to spend all this money and years of development to get a human landing system 
down to say, I don't know, a hundred or 200 feet, uh, and then just have to abort because you know, the, the computer wasn't doing it right. You might as well let the humans actually be able to, to get on the controls and move it if they have to, and to make that adjustment that's needed to make the mission more successful. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That would, that would stink. All right. Is there an <laughs> ideal, uh, vehicle? Uh, it could be crewed or uncrewed that are, that is, it doesn't matter, uh, that you think is most or best, I guess, best suited for lunar landings. That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know that I have a like personal preference. I think the, <laughs> the engineering kind of shakes out. There's a reason why some of these vehicles look the way they do. Right. And, and even going back to the lunar excursion module, uh, in the Apollo days, I, I think there's a joke that that's basically the design you get when you when you let engineers run wild and they don't have to worry about aerodynamics. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't think there's a a preference. Crucially, as we look at going back to the moon and doing it in a sustained manner and and keeping it going, um, that is going to require a significant change from what we saw in Apollo. Um, so I, I think as we move into this new class where we're starting to reuse our landers. Uh, that's going to be huge. I mean, I think that is an inflection point for humanity as we're able to to put more tonnage on the surface and be able to reuse it. I'm hoping that will actually allow us to outlive what Apollo did once we once we start to live and build and grow on the moon. So Emily has given you a load of very serious uh, questions which we needed to ask, and now I'm going to come in with the um, the absurd. <laughs> So with, with the uh, with the recent failure and partial failure of two U.S. private companies to land on the moon, land a probe on the moon, we've seen a lot of people online who seem to think they're experts on this all of a sudden, and they seem to like giving their hot takes. So as someone who is an actual expert on this, what type of comment annoys you the most? <laughs> annoys me the most. Boy, you know, I, I think a lot of... The comments that are kind of like, you know, we'd figure this out back in the 60s and we can't do it today with all of our, you know, uh, AI and computers and everything. And I, I think that's um, that's not quite right. I wouldn't say it necessarily annoys me, but it just shows that even back in the 60s, it was very hard. And uh, it's kind of a miracle that we were able to do these things back then. Um, and I think as we're seeing now, uh, it, it's still very hard. You know, we always look at our technology and we look at the generations before us and we think, oh, well, we're so much smarter and we have so much more advanced technology. But at the end of the day, it is just physics, right? And it is still very difficult uh, to, to land on the moon. And, and so I think it's almost like a, a, we don't want to trivialize that. It is, it is very hard. Well, the space business is very hard. <laughs> Yeah, I guess the, the 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 thing we see a lot is is um, from my perspective when I see co those kind of comments, is I always think yeah, but a lot of the people that were around making those choices and and learning from that things, those those projects aren't around anymore. So you've got a lot of new people having to figure th figure stuff out that they may have learned fifty years ago that just hasn't been passed down or perhaps wasn't documented at the time. So is there a way of practicing? landing on on the moon on earth is there an accurate way of doing that because that would obviously be very useful if there was or or is it really hard to recreate those conditions here so it, it certainly is hard to recreate that here um i think you know famously back in the, the 60s before apollo went and landed um there were some pretty wild vehicles that the astronauts flew the flying bedstead as as i think it was yeah. referred to that it, that Neil Armstrong actually had to eject out of. Uh, and there was a famous clip of him like uh, ejecting out the thing exploding and him coming down on a parachute. It's it's kind of crazy. So a lot of that was to try to replicate some of the control response that you see uh, in the lunar environment. Um, and so I think without going too in the weeds, right? When you have one six G, that means your uh, thrust vector, if you will, is a lot shorter. And so what happens when you try to land on the moon is you actually have to go to larger attitudes with the vehicle than you normally would, say, landing a helicopter on Earth or whatever. And so that that does take practice. Back in the 60s, that was what they did. They also had simulators. Um, nowadays, we have better simulators uh, that, that NASA is actually building and going through and trying to to practice these things practice going to those weird attitudes, practice going to the South Pole, 
of the moon, which has its own unique challenges from the lighting conditions and the terrain. Um, so I, I think there are ways to get after certain aspects of it. And obviously, you don't want to do it for the first time when you're doing it on the actual moon. Uh, so we, we do need to practice as much as we can here. But, but I certainly don't think uh, there's anything that can fully replicate that moment when the first Artemis three astronauts are headed to the surface. They're on short final, if you will. And <laughs> uh, the, the blood is pumping. They've got... 1.6 G, they're kicking up dust, it's dark. It's really hard to replicate that, but if you take out those pieces individually and practice them over and over and over again, uh, which is what NASA's doing, that should take some of that away and, ma and make it a little bit uh, easier to, uh, to manage. So you mentioned earlier that a couple of pieces of the Surveyor 3 spacecraft got brought back. They're, they're the only things that have been brought back that from a spacecraft that landed on the moon, other than things that were inside spacecraft, right? Because none of the lunar modules have come come back. They're all either well, the landing legs are still on the on the moon, and the the other bits either are all over the place. My point with that is, would it have been really useful to for, for the work that you're doing to be able to analyze a spacecraft that has already landed on the moon? Um, yeah, and I think that's that's really kind of what that research was. So my advisor, uh, Phil Metzger, um, was actually one of the individuals who uh, was able to look at some of the return bits of that spacecraft. And his whole point was trying to figure out, okay, what does that tell us about the the plume coming out from uh, Apollo 12 when they landed? I think you're right. I think that is the only bits that we've, we've brought back here. But I think they've told us a lot, right? I, I think in that particular case, we know we can kind of measure the damage and figure out, okay, what are the velocities and how many particles are coming out. Apollo 12 actually landed like up on the the rim of this ridge line uh, just above Surveyor. And so uh, I think a lot of that math basically showed that they were kind of lucky and that most of the most of the plume went right over it. Uh, oh, wow. But we still see a lot of impacts on it. So, you know, it's not like we land on the moon every day, so it's hard to like... You got to get your data points where you can, and that's just one crucial one um, that you know, scientists have been able to study that to show, like, hey, this 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 might be a thing we need to need to look at. And when you're doing your studies, are space agencies and companies happy to share data with you, or, or is it really difficult to get data on on spacecraft that haven't been successful or the ones that have been successful? Do, do people willing to give that stuff out or not really? Yeah, I mean it's. Definitely a different time, I think, in the space industry where, uh, and, and rightfully so, commercial companies are starting to, to finally enter the market, right? And there's a, there's a lot of money uh, going into these commercial companies and being able to land uh, payloads or land humans, in some cases, on, on the surface. And so I do think uh, some of that information obviously is proprietary. And so companies like to uh, may not want to share all the details. And, and that is definitely their their prerogative, right? Uh, and I think that's slightly different than like the Apollo days where a lot of stuff was open kimono, you know, just out there. Um, yeah. But either way, I mean, the like I said, the physics uh, is is the same, right? So yeah. uh, I think we can we can kind of speculate what might happen in certain cases, and certainly those companies have their own experts that are kind of digging into this problem, no pun intended, and uh, uh, hopefully we can figure out together how to land on the moon. And, and one final one from me. Is there one thing which is which makes it incredibly difficult or is it that there are multiple factors involved that are all difficult themselves combined together? I would say it's there are several factors that are difficult when you put them all together. And that's actually not a bad thing, right? Because then we can kind of chip away at solving those problems with, with engineering and, and procedures and how we're going to do certain things and developing technology. I read this uh, article here the last few days where basically folks were talking about, well, it's so hard to go back to the moon and uh, should we even be doing it? And there should be some bit of uncomfort, right? You have to kind of push the, push the boundary a little bit. If it was so easy, like, you know, then we're probably not doing it right or we're not yeah. growing or expanding our capabilities as a species. Um, but if it's too large of a step, right, that's that's a different problem. So uh, I think when you look at Apollo and, and what was accomplished then, right, it was a very limited number of missions and very scoped. Um, 
when you look at Artemis, it kind of makes sense in the bigger picture that, you know, if we want to have this sustained presence outside of Earth, be it on the moon or eventually in Mars, we have to develop these technologies. Uh, and so being able to, to tackle these individual problems, the moon is a great training ground to do that, right? I mean, certainly going to Mars, there's going to be a lot of difficulties that are very similar to what we see on the moon, uh, landing in a dusty environment. In that yeah. case, you're going to have a, a very thin atmosphere of CO2 to, to deal with. What are, what does the human component look like? What are the logistics of supporting uh, people that far away? You know, when we look at the moon, there's some unique challenges, especially on the South Pole with, with the lighting and the terrain. But as we kind of solve those problems, it just really helps us uh, set up for the next, you know, going on to going on to Mars or, or, or standing up a base on the moon. And so I think it's important to say that, you know, while there's a lot of uh, healthy criticism and skepticism when people look at some of these problems, none of these are insurmountable. And, and I do think like this is our generation's time to step up and solve these technical challenges uh, to, to actually get us there. You know, I, I used to joke how uh, I look back at the Apollo days and I always thought, man, I, I'd, I was just born in the wrong decade. I can't believe I, I missed it. That was like the pinnacle of, you know, human space exploration. But then you almost have to pinch yourself now because we're, this is our own Apollo moment, right? Like we're, we're doing it. We're going back. They're literally bending metal and, and building spacecraft to do it. Um, and uh, it's a really hard problem. Um, sure, it'll be difficult to put all this together, but what an exciting time to like be able to actually go and do this absolutely well thank you so much for joining us brandon this has been a wonderful interview thoroughly enjoyed all of it, all of it. Uh, yeah learned a lot as well i can tell our listeners right now that some of the facial expressions that emily and i have pulled during this interview have been very entertaining as we've had our <laughs> minds blown and maybe i'll put some what, screenshots what a crazy up. Clip. yeah good. there's been a Whoa! yeah there's been a few things uh, that certainly have yeah. got some reactions from us I didn't know Surveyor got sandblasted or moonblasted. I should say that. I mean, it it makes sense that that happened, but I mean, it perfectly makes sense. But still, I'm like, wow, I didn't know. It seems like an easy thing to think about, but I never thought about what's the effect of that kind of blast on equipment over and over and over and over again. Yeah, so Surveyor was moon blasted. There you <laughs> <Yeah>. go. That's, <laughs> That's the takeaway from this interview. That's for the takeaway. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Brandon. We really appreciate your time and good luck with all the work you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate it. Coming at you hotter than a hunk of Skylab over Australia, you're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. For someone who has got as many degrees as Brandon has. It's like 20 degrees or something. I'm like, oh yeah. my God. It's clearly as accomplished and uh, academic and wonderful as he is. How down to earth and accessible was he during that interview? Right? Yeah, he was totally cool. Very accessible, really friendly, no attitude. I have talked to nobody on this podcast, luckily, but I've talked no. to people in my life who had no real credentials, who were, who were total jackasses. <laughs> Excuse my language, but yeah, this guy has done everything and is literally a very one of the friendliest people. So yeah, that it's pretty awesome. Dave's probably gonna censor that whole part of the show out. So no, nah, that's staying in. <laughs> <laughs> that's staying in. Warts but it's the truth. It's the truth, though. I mean, I yeah, hate absolutely. saying it, but it's the truth. You know. Yeah, but what a wonderful interview that was. When we've been looking so long for someone to talk about this subject. We struck gold there. That was yeah, absolute we gold. We learned so much. There's so much in that I didn't know. I never heard about the, well, I think I may have done, but it's never really landed with me about the idea if you land hard enough with a big enough spacecraft, you're going to end up sending dust into the lunar orbit. That makes sense, but I never thought about it. Exactly. And then that's going to cause a lot of problems for anything that wants to go back. So there's a, there's yep. a serious reason why this has taken so long to get right and making sure that we're only sending the correct spacecraft there because if we get this wrong and we're going to ruin it for everyone you, if you've yeah. got a load of dust flying around there's no way you can even put spacecraft in orbit yeah it's like having a bunch of space debris up there and it doesn't yeah. really matter and people are like oh it's fine moon dust well fine dust can cause still impinge on things and cause a lot of problems as we've seen yeah and we <laughs> know how how crazy that lunar regolith is as well yeah 
uh, you know this because we've been to the Smithsonian, but um, and we talked to her on the show last week, Lisa Young. But we've we've heard and and seen they've microscopically looked at the Apollo suits. They have tiny microscopic cuts and tears in them from the moon lo- from the lunar mooner lunar. That should be the word <laughs> mooner uh, from the lunar regolith. But seriously, they have those yeah. tiny cuts in them, and this is you know very strong fabric but that was engineered for the apollo program so yeah we know how destructive this stuff can be i think brandon really kind of he made it like wow okay this makes perfect sense why this is totally dangerous you know and it 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 is and why it is really challenging um the part I, i think i've talked about it before the surveyor part where they found that um Apollo 12, it's it's landing basically impinged on parts of Surveyor and, and it got blasted by all the regolith there. And I never really thought about how that phenomenon, if you have a moon base, like let's say NASA builds a structure up there, sort of like Jamestown and for all mankind, right? Yeah, that's what I was thinking of as well. Yep. And they keep landing vehicles there, you know, over the years, right? What's that going to do to the structure? It's going to keep getting blasted by all that lunar dust is there going to be a solution to that it's a it's an answer to a question why have we not got a lunar base already which exactly. i never considered i never considered that to be a problem but it is a problem and i love the fact they were able to analyze the the parts of surveyor that came back surveyor free that came back and figure out exactly what trajectory that lunar dust was sent out from the apollo 12 spacecraft like as as Brandon said, physics is physics, right? Yeah, you can't really <laughs> some, defeat it. You can't defeat it. The, yeah, the numbers the numbers don't lie in in many ways. Exactly. So, yeah, it's uh, fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, I yeah. absolutely love that interview, and I hope our listeners have as well. Yeah, it, it, this is kind of a, a a side note, but it's sort of now Dave's gonna roll his eyes back into his, so far into his head. He's gonna see his brain. I always wonder why, like. You know, Gerard K. O'Neill had the idea for a lunar mass driver. You know, we take this lunar material and blow it out of the lunar atmosphere and, you know, build a space colony with it. And I always wondered why, you know, that seems like a neat idea. Why hasn't that been done? And now I'm like, maybe it's because the lunar material is not stable enough. You know, maybe that's why and maybe it would contaminate. um, There's no lunar atmosphere, but or very little tiny bit, maybe moon atmosphere. But maybe there's a potential it could contaminate the area around and make the area, you know, not habitable to spacecraft. So I never really thought about that. Not dissing O'Neill at all, but there's a lot of... (laughs) Because I don't want his people coming after me, man. Trust me, his fans are like Swifties, man. They they really are. But... um. No, but seriously, like, and that's not a diss against O'Neill because he wasn't a lunar materials expert, you know, really. I mean, he was a great scientist, but he probably did not know about that factor where I'm sure a lot of people didn't know about that factor back then, back in the 70s. So that's something that I'm now like, well, maybe that needed to be thought through a little bit further because of the material. The material might be I don't want to say dangerous, but the material might, it could hurt other spacecraft or it could hurt people possibly, you know, if, if there were people up there, because as we see the, the Smithsonian, the spacesuits, when I saw the microscopic parts where you could see the fabric getting cut by the regolith, I was shocked. Yeah. My brain has been exploded by this interview in the best way possible. So I'm very, I'm very enthusiastic right now. Absolutely. Um, if for those of you on our Patreon, you could watch that interview with Brandon uh, unedited uh, at patreon.com forward slash space and things. Uh, and there's more information about Brandon in the show notes, which you can find on space and things podcast.com or by clicking the link in the description of this podcast on your podcast provider. Uh, Houston, we've got a reading here that says you're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. Over. So, Emily, what has caught your eye in spaceflight this week? A couple things have caught my eye in spaceflight this week. First, uh, NASA's Dragonfly mission to Titan uh, was confirmed this week. Uh, Titan is, of course, one of uh, the moons on Saturn. It's believed that it could have uh, not Earth-like qualities, but it may hold the key to life. 
Who knows? Maybe uh, yeah. has lifelike conditions. But a uh, dragonfly is essentially a Titan drone. It's like a helicopter. I believe what its mission is going to do, it's going to fly to dozens of locations on the moon looking for, uh, this is from the press release, looking for prebiotic chemical processes common on both Titan and early Earth before life developed. So that's very uh, exciting. It does have a huge budget. Uh, I'm looking at the price here. I think its total life cycle cost is $3.35 billion, not a small amount, but that that's fairly, I guess, standard right now, given the amount of uh, inflation in the United States and plus how expensive it is just to send a spacecraft to space, period. Uh, we've seen yeah. how the Mars sample return thing has had issues lately. That is good news. So uh, that is supposed to launch, I believe, in 2028. It's not going to launch anytime nice. soon. Uh, it'll be likely four or more, who knows, more, maybe more years from now, but uh, it's supposed to launch by 2028. So I am certainly looking forward to uh, seeing updates on that spacecraft. That'll be really cool. Another, this is kind of a quick note, but some good news for the first time since November, Voyager 1 is talking to Earth in a way that is coherent. Yes. It is no longer the drunk uncle of space flight. It is talking. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably a bad. That's that's. Ex- I apologize to drunk uncles out there. Um, drunk uncles everywhere. We'll be sending uncles. in their uh, sending in their complaints. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wouldn't mind being being uh, compared to Voyager One though. I'll take that. As I've a- definitely been a drunk auntie at points in my life, so I wouldn't mind that comparison. That's okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> So the Voyager team, I'm reading this from the JPL press release. By the way, I did not come up with this text. I'm just reading from the press release. But the team, the Voyager team discovered that a chip responsible, keep in mind this chip is my age, it's 46 years old, uh, responsible for storing a portion of the FDS memory, um, including some of the software's code was not working. What the team did was they decided to place the affected code elsewhere in the FDS memory. They divided the affected code into... This is like like brain exploding stuff here that they did. They divided the affected code into sections and stored those sections into different places in the FDS memory. Crazy. Yeah. And then uh, they started singling out the code responsible for packaging the spaceship's engineering data and then sent it to a new location in the FDS memory on April 18th, uh, a few days ago. A radio signal to get to Voyager takes about 22 and a half hours, which is nuts. I think in 2026, Voyager 1 is going to be a light day from Earth. So it's going to wow. take 24 hours for a signal to come to and come back. Yeah, but to put a long story short, uh, when they heard back from the spacecraft on April 20th, roughly two days later, they saw that the modification worked and that they had, you know, normal updates from the spacecraft. So that's really incredible. I can't believe they did that. Like I said, the spacecraft is older than I am, which says a lot. Uh, I'm starting to wear out. My joints are not what they used to be, folks. So the fact that they were able to do this to a spacecraft that is, God, almost 50 years old. This is nothing short of amazing. Uh, to my knowledge, Voyager 2 is functioning just fine. That is its sister spacecraft, which I also believe is in interstellar space. And it was launched roughly around the same period in fall of uh, 1977. So great update yep. from uh, very far away in space. So Dave, what has caught your eye this week? Well, I, I also was looking at that Dragonfly story, and it's it's really cool, isn't it? It comes off... Yeah. I, I think the announcement's aptly required right now, given that uh, the Ingenuity helicopter passed away, so to speak, uh, yeah. just a couple of months back now. And to have a project like this, which comes off the heels of that, really, um, yeah. I, I think is exciting. The s- story that's caught my eye this week, though, was a story shared by Frank White, who we've had on this podcast before, of the overview effect fame. And he shared an article on his LinkedIn page. And the headline is this, Mohammed Faris, the first Syrian astronaut, dies as a refugee. And the sub-headline is, during his time in space, he decided to quit the military and make it his mission to educate people in science and astronomy uh, to, quote, pass on the privileged view 
end quote, that he had been given. Um, he died at the age of 72 on Friday, the 19th of April, as a result of a long illness in Turkey, where he'd lived as a refugee since 2012. Uh, wow. Se- selected back in 1985 as part of Soviet Union's Intercosmos program and uh, launched on his first and only space, qu- space flight on July 22nd, 1987. Um, so yes, I, uh, sad news, but I, this is a story. I recommend people read this article. It will be in the show notes along with articles of the stories that Emily has shared today as well. Um, and it, it, it's one of those stories that is quite inspiring. So I, I do recommend reading that one, uh, check out our show notes and, uh, and learn some more about, uh, Mohammed Faris. Yes. And, and, uh, our deepest condolences to his family and colleagues. Absolutely. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. Okay, thanks for joining us this week. We always appreciate you joining us while we talk about space and some things. <laughs> Don't forget to let us know what you think. The best way of doing this is to write a review on your podcast platform if it has the option. So please have a look and do that if you wouldn't mind. And of course, as always, thanks to our Patreon subscribers who continue to power what we do. We cannot thank you enough. We'll be back with more Space and Things next week. But until then, don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. And remember, when you fire your lasers in space, no one can hear the beam. <laughs>